thank you everyone for joining us tonight for our second uh, virtual artist talk of the season. Let me start letting more people in. Um, my name is Angel Kleiman and I'm the director of the Rosemary Duffy Larson Gallery here on central campus of Broward College. And tonight's speaker is Jared Czarzewski whose monumental installation work, Rim Rift, is now on view in the gallery. Uh, we invite you to visit the gallery and uh, come see it in person or see it online at BrowardVPA.com. So welcome, Jared. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, uh, it's, it's been a really great experience uh, here at uh, Broward College and in the gallery. And, uh, and Angel Kleinman is, 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 is very much a, a big part of that. She, uh, she uh, and her crew there, uh, Avon and Antonio, they, they just did such a great job helping me and making me feel welcomed and, uh, and being open for things. When, when you're doing an installation like this, you gotta, you gotta sort of take chances and you gotta trust and, uh, and they're just great every step of the way. I, I can't, uh, can't say enough about them. Thank you so much. Thank you. What, what do we do now? Do we go right to that? If you wanna uh, oh, share your screen. Sure, I'm going to share my screen. All right, is it, is it, you're getting the right thing? Is it just the city view there, is it? Or? Yeah, we're seeing it good. Okay, awesome. Well, um, well, this is where it started here. This is my hometown of Winnipeg. Uh, it's in the very center of Canada. Uh, in the, and kind of in the lower part of Manitoba, and uh, and I grew up uh, kind of close to the close to the city a bit in the north end till about nine till I was about nine years old. Then I moved to this suburb of Transcona. Uh, Transcona was kind of the uh, the typical uh, kind of thing you would think of here in America, right? Cul de sacs and really nothing to do, and lots of soccer fields and. Uh, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was pretty typical uh, kind of thing, right? It had, it seemed like for a while there, it was surrounded by two things. There were junkyards and there were golf courses uh, pretty much everywhere uh, uh, surrounding us, right? And we kind of made our way into those uh, spaces in ways, but uh, not conventionally. I never really played golf, but, uh, you know, uh, the auto wreckers and, and this kind of reuse kind of thing what was always sort of uh, in my uh, in my peripheral view uh, um, um, I, you know we eventually we got into cars and stuff so we were always going to to find parts for our cars and things like that uh, it was a big part of our culture there so uh, and I always saw the, the idea of a golf course and the thing is about these spaces that so many of them were were built on landfill sites right so it was kind of this weird uh, kind of uh, ultimately groomed landscape very uh, synthetic looking and uh, and, and uh, sort of hyper real like and and I, I was always sort of gravitating toward those kinds of things uh, and it made its way into my work in a lot of ways and, and you'll, you'll see in a minute there I, I did some work in the film industry when I was there I built sets for a lot of local artists and things. Uh, and the thing is, uh, what I was always into is, is the idea of, again, about simulating uh, uh, aesthetics, simulating reality. Uh, uh, that, like this barn is, is really tiny, but I had to make it look real. So I had to make this wood look very old. Uh, and it was uh, this, for this movie set, it was, it was very cool kind of thing. I, I got a job for this one artist. Uh, this was this sort of rockscape kind of thing I had to build out of concrete, a steel arm. Uh, sort of making things look real, but we're really they're, they're not, and sort of making them look natural, but, but not. Right, uh, um, soon, but just before grad school, I got a job in the Bahamas. Uh, 
and I worked on, a, on an island there, but we spent some time in, in the sort of local casinos there, just sort of goofing around. And, uh, and there was this piece there by, this is by this artist, Dale Chihuly. Like he's this pretty renowned glass artist. And, and, I, and I love this thing right away. It was really kind of an interesting thing. And you get close to it and you can see all these sort of shards of these, uh, uh, of this sort of cast or, or sort of worked glass that Dale Chihuly does. The thing is though, I always thought like, like why not make it out of like Coke bottles or something? I think it would be more interesting to, to have this aesthetic and to be able to walk up to it and then realize, whoa, those are Coke bottles or something, right? I, I think there, there's a, there was an ad, a thing that could be done there to, to push it further, I think. Nothing against Dale Chihuly, I'm, he's a master, absolutely. But uh, uh, I, I wanted to put my spin on that kind of thing uh, earlier on. This is a, a piece I did uh, in Missoula at the University of Montana, Missoula. It, it, it's called Tides Everglade, right? Uh, and it was a three room installation. There were two video projections and a, uh, and a kinetic sculpture installation, right? So, so uh, uh, it, it was inspired by some uh, uh, things that I was experiencing right when I moved to Charleston, South Carolina. This is a sign that, that sort of pops up uh, from time to time you see in, in Charleston there. And it kind of it kind of rubs me the wrong way a little bit. I, I'm very much a naturalist and I like seeing the sort of open spaces. I think that that is uh, what I got from my, uh, from my, my sort of prairie upbringing, I think. Um, but, but to see like, a, a, you know, power lines and stuff running through a conservation area. And then you can, you can go to the sales office and buy a chunk of land, right? So it's a little bit weird. I mean, they're using the idea of a conservation area to, to sell homes, right? People want to live there, uh, uh, you know, and you should really just leave it untouched, I think. So one of the things that, uh, um, that's done a lot in the, the sort of wetlands is this sort of off-roading and this ATVing kind of thing. It kind of kind of uh, is a way to embrace the, um, the outdoors in a way, but it kind of is still destructive in some way, right? To churn up the bottom of the wetland is, uh, is to sort of, uh, sort of drain the water and, and destroy it, right? A wetland is, is sort of a filter for, for water in the forest, but this obviously destroys it. And then we have uh, uh, this, uh, this was inspired by in that piece there in the, um, uh, in the hallway of the gallery space, right? So uh, it was a video taken from the underside of a, uh, the undercarriage of, a, of, a, of an ATV. And there are these, these uh, um, tire tracks moving across it like that, so. Oops. Right, and this was the kinetic portion of that project, right? It uh, was uh, uh, the, these sort of grass flowerettes that were suspended from the ceiling but it had a, uh, this fan mechanism inside of there. So when you walk in the room, it was motion activated and, it, and everything would just start to sway and move. Uh, and it was this really graceful thing, but it was inverted, right? So it sort of emphasized uh, sort of the stress and the, uh, of the wetland and, and the natural environment. Uh, just a little bit on, on some other artists here. This is uh, the work of, of my, uh, one of my, one of my uh, sort of heroes. This is Olafur Eliasson, right? So I, I, like, I like, he's, he does the same kind of thing where he simulates natural things, right? This natural waterfall. He's done a lot of things with rockscapes and landscapes and things. Uh, but he always exposes the mechanism. He, he, he likes to expose this pump and this and this infrastructure to make this this thing I, and I think it's very poetic right it's it's sort of to give credit to nature that it, it's it's happening happening naturally like something so beautiful but but for mankind to do it you need all this really sort of structural uh, product there so it was a uh, that's interesting uh, uh, sort of reflection on that Oh, this is like one of my favorite sculptures what, uh, in, in history, right? Uh, this is the work of Brian Jungen. He's a Canadian artist. And the thing is, what this guy does is he, uh, he takes these inanimate objects, these, these deletable objects, uh, these deck chairs, these plastic chairs, and he makes these really amazing sort of uh, spiritual objects out of them. He's Native American, and, uh, and he puts so much of this sort of 
awe, this aura into these, these like useless objects, right? And this is this whale, skull, whale skeleton that he's made, right? So very cool. Tara Donovan, you know, uh, really one of my, my favorites as well. She did a lot of work with these sort of plastic cups. I can't really, the environmental impact of all these cups is like, I really can't get by it. Uh, I'm still a big fan of her work, but uh, uh, it was, uh, it was, it's a hard thing to sort of uh, think about what, what's happening to this cups and the quantity to produce this. It's a beautiful piece of work, uh, beautiful art. But uh, again, for myself, I, it, has to, it has to have a second uh, sort of chance at, at another life or even a third chance or something before I can use it in my work. Uh, this is a piece I did uh, here in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, this is the, the piece called Scarp. Uh, and it, is, uh, it is this, uh, uh, you can see that sort of uh, the idea of that golf course sort of getting in here, right? This sort of manicured landscape, this hyper real landscape. And, uh, and it's made of these t-shirts and this clothing. And the, uh, you know, I was really thinking about fast fashion and things like that. It was really a breakthrough piece for me. Uh, you know, uh, uh, for you young artists out there, you, you work and you, and you try things and, 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 and some things hit, some things miss, whatever, but then you do something and then everybody just sort of gets it, right? Uh, and this was that piece for me. I must've done about 15 of these projects throughout uh, North America, US and Canada. And, uh, and it was always the same idea, uh, cooperating with, with places like Goodwill and the Salvation Army to, to borrow clothing, never to, to consume anything. And, uh, and everything goes back afterwards. Nothing is altered, nothing is glued down or anything. It's just sort of cleverly stacked there, so. And again, like I say, the, the idea of that golf course, this, this hyper real, uh, yet surreal landscape always sort of plays, uh, plays into what I'm doing. And there's another thought of it. I mean, the idea of an installation, I think, uh, it, it sort of slices through the walls if you, as if you can imagine it going like infinitely, right? Uh, in, infinitely rolling into the distance. That's really important for, the, for that particular project. Uh, this is uh, this work of uh, now a good friend of mine, Derek Nylander, right? So, I was doing those clothing things and then and then someone sent me this email like like hey look at this guy he's doing this this email he's doing the same kind of thing as you man i mean sorry about, about that i guess maybe you'll have to do something else and i was i kind of laughed i was so blown away that by this beautiful work and and to me it's it's like very obviously many uh, things overlapping but much more things like not in common right there, there's there's certainly room for both of us in there so it was a, a very interesting thing uh, uh, to have that. And like I say, for young artists, uh, uh, don't be discouraged if you find someone doing something similar to you, you know, introduce yourself to them. Uh, like, like I know Derek now, and we're even determined to show together one day, I think. It's, it's really, a, it's really a, a, a very positive thing when, 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 that, when that can happen. So don't be discouraged. It's, it's, it's so impossible to have a brand new idea out there. So uh, uh, always be, be positive about it. I look, and there's that Dale Drew. This piece is called Don't Breathe. And I did it at a residency in, uh, at, in Cutstown, Pennsylvania. So uh, uh, I, this is all done with like Goodwill glass. And, and it started with, uh, with those flower vases. Like everybody has that, uh, that, that cupboard in their house that's full of flower vases and uh, I, you know, I put out an email on our campus saying, I want those flower vases. And everyone was just sort of ecstatically happy to, uh, to go get those flower vases and donate them to me because they keep them and they don't want to throw them away and they don't know what to do with them, but they keep them anyway. And this was their outlet. I, I must've got about 500 of these vases. And then uh, I just went to Goodwill and, uh, and I was talking to my contacts there, like, I'll take whatever glass you have. And it was easy to, uh, to accumulate. A lot of this stuff you think it's impossible to accumulate all that. It's extremely easy. And this is part of the problem, I think. It shouldn't be this available. It shouldn't be this uh, readily uh, at your disposal, uh, th this quantity of things. This was a, a collaborative project I did with uh, one of my mentors, Andrea Stanislav, right? So this was done in Palem, New 
York at the Palem Art Center. And it was, uh, it was made out of some uh, like curb alert kind of uh, uh, dressers and desks and things, right? Things that you just find on, on the curb. And we just accumulated these and we brought these to the Palem Art Center not knowing what we wanted to do. And, and they, we, we pulled up and they said, well, where are you gonna put all that stuff? And we're like, well, you tell us. And they said, well, there's a shed over there. And we saw the shed and we're all like, well, we're not, that piece is, uh, that, that shed is the piece. We, we're not going to, uh, we, we quickly ripped the walls off and tried to start modifying it. All the drawers work and all the cupboards work on there. And the thing is you're, you're too, the, like it's an open courtyard. So the public can walk up and, and sort of, open the drawers and find things. And the idea is that you, if you take something, you have to leave something there. And, and it was a really sort of a, a nice community aspect of it. As people were sort of uh, putting unique things every night, we would see something unique in there. Like somebody put in some bowling shoes because they're because that bowling pin. And then another person put a bowling ball like that. Like this is like many days going on. And, and then sadly it got trashed as you know, somebody came in and just, just ripped it apart. But uh, you know, how many times can you rebuild that kind of thing, right? But it was, it was a great experiment. Uh, uh, people were really into it for, for a while. It's, it's very good. Uh, this is a piece called, uh, called Shmata Schist. This is at, uh, at the Grand Canyon um, National Park headquarters in, in Grand Canyon National Park, right? So this is this, is this um, this sort of uh, uh, passageway, it's a 10 foot cube, it's a wooden armature, but then these pants are just attached onto it, right? And again, uh, it's something that you just accumulate, uh, like I'm, I'm now becoming the person that people call when, when an unusual quantity of, of materials or, or, or objects, and, and they ask if, if I want these things. And most of the time, well, all the time, I always say, yes, 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 I will come get those. And, uh, and, I'll, and, and I'll have them for a little while and then I'll eventually do something with them, right? And, and this was sort of modeled after this thing called Antelope Canyon, where there's this, you can wind through this like rocky canyon inside of there and you see the stratified earth on the, uh, on the canyon walls. And, and it had, it was open to the sky. So you could get this sort of, uh, uh, sort of, it wasn't so dark inside of this, this canyon there, so. Well, like I say, it was about a 10 foot cube. Uh, and, and this is in 2014. I did this in Homer, Alaska, right? So this is, uh, this is, uh, I was, again, this is a lot about sort of borrowed materials. It was too expensive to bring things to Homer, Alaska. So my proposal for this, in, for this residency was that I was going to, I was just gonna find stuff there. Uh, uh, it was uh, not uh, long after the, uh, the tsunami there in, in Fukushima, Japan. So this, this debris was washing up there and on the shores in Alaska of all these, uh, like amazing, just just weird things. So that was my idea to accumulate things and uh, and make my my work out of that. But something went horribly wrong. You see, this uh, this busload of senior citizens showed up, and they they just traveled the country cleaning up beaches, and and these selfish seniors just cleaned up the whole beach and threw it all away. So uh, so I had no nothing to work with there. It was uh, it was very sad. I was uh, everyone was delightfully happy about this but I was I was a little miserable but I I quickly pounded the the, the, the streets there and and found these things in people's yards there were these uh, uh like in front of people's driveways they had these tall the, the, everyone had these I was I was like what are those right and they said they are fishing buoys right they wash up on the shore and they're they're and they're just buoys and people collect them uh, and, and I said well that's my piece right every and everyone sort of loan these to the, to the piece. Uh, it was another thing where people had these things and they, and they were dying to do something with them. They really didn't know what. So uh, when I came along, they were happy to loan me these things. Again, I don't own anything. It all goes back afterwards. Although I, I think that piece is still there in, uh, in Homer. They kind, of, they kind of got to it. So. And the piece sort of dissected the wall again and went into the gallery like that, right? And, and those are these, these whiskey barrels mixed in with it, right? There was a meadery, they made mead, 
Like I didn't, uh, I don't know, people still do that, but they made mead there in this town and they had these arrows and they said I could borrow them as long as I didn't cut them up. And they're just kind of sitting. There's a wooden armature in there. And, uh, uh, and you know, everything is attached onto there. And again, it's temporary. This part went away because this is a, a, an indoor gallery but the out part, uh, outside part is still there. This is a piece called Rat's Nest. It, is, uh, it was done at like Washington Marin in, um, in Virginia, I think. Sorry, Virginia, possibly. Uh, at a, at a, and this is one of the things I, I was doing uh, where I, I needed like an army of students to help me put this thing together, right? Uh, uh, I, so I had like a dumpster full Ways, these cables and I, I wanted to make this form out of it right and it involved sort of a, a weaving kind of technique to, to put it together and, and it took about you know 20 students a day for like a solid week to because to, it's woven quite beautifully uh, and I was Im impressed that with the tolerance from what from me wanting them to do this and uh, and they were all understanding and, and very eager to help and uh, you know that the piece turned out really well uh, because of that and 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 again, I wasn't there when they took it down, but I, I, truth, legend is they all crawled through the thing and, uh, and got good, good video or photos from it. So I, I was happy with that. Uh, this is a piece called, um, called Soil. This is done at the McAllis McMaster Gallery there at the University of uh, South Carolina, right in Columbia. Again, it was a, another sort of product of a phone call about, I, I have a bunch of bicycle tires, right? And uh, as soon as I, I got a bunch of bicycle tires, I started cutting them up and, and figuring out how to, what I could do with them, how to fasten them together. Uh, how could I build form with just a bunch of bicycle tires, right? So it's, it's, a, it's an old recipe of a sort of a wooden armature. And then, um, with the, the tires and tubes sort of fastened onto the, it sort of makes this sort of lava flow looking thing, I think. Uh, it, it's a, it was a, another sort of long, long week of, uh, of, of working with students and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and just having a good time, right? Listen to all the chatter in the gallery and the students are talking about these tires and that. It's really, uh, it's really great to listen to really young people uh, just getting excited and, and worked up and emotional about, about whatever. And it's uh, something I uh, find entertaining. Maybe I shouldn't, but I do. There's a close up shot of it. So, oh, This piece was done just last year at the, uh, uh, at, uh, what is it? it's called Battlesticks Oversized and it's called and it was at the Washington Jefferson uh, College in Pennsylvania. And, and it's another one of these absurd calls that I get about, I have like a thousand of these golf clubs. Uh, do, you, do you want them? And I'm like, yes. Uh, but here's the thing, I need about 3000 of them to do this piece. And this guy was able to round them up. He would never tell me where he was getting these things, but uh, they're, all, they're all used, but they're all perfect in perfectly usable condition. Uh, they're not like, old or anything, uh, they're, they're, they're perfectly fine. Uh, so another one of these things, like you sh we shouldn't be able to exhaust, we shouldn't be exhausting our resources like this. This is uh, absurd. Uh, uh, why are we consuming uh, needlessly, uh, right? When these are all perfectly, perfectly good to use. I, I understand things wear out, but these were all in, in, in perfect shape. And you know, they had these sort of these names on the bottom of the clubs that you could read some of them like the secret weapon like maybe don't mention that one because the golfers you know they'll know right the bear claw that's a good one right and have this this passageway down through the center of it again just just to make it sort of interactive uh and and they're all sort of zip tied together very temporarily right so it, it all comes down uh, uh, uh pretty easy a lot easier than it was to go up that's for sure Right, so this brings us to the, uh, to the to Broward College piece, right? So the original idea was, was something much different. It was much more of a, of a social media uh, generated uh, construction, right? Uh, gathering materials from social media, uh, curb alerts, again, uh, uh, free stuff on, on, on Facebook and, and things like that. 
uh, and I would have like uh, like an army of students to, to help construct this thing in the space. Uh, but the COVID, um, the pandemic hit and I wasn't able to do anything like that. And I had to come up with something that I could do by myself or with a couple of people. Uh, but I still wanted to do something that is going to fill the space. Look at, they had this cavernous gallery here, this 40 foot tall ceiling with a lift, like no ladders. Like that is a, that is a, a miracle, right? So I was uh, determined to fill this space uh, with, with something uh, uh, in, as it pertains to my work. And, and, but but how, what could I use that was, was fast and... Um, you know, and, and light enough that I could do it myself or almost by myself. I, I, and for this piece, you know, I was thinking a lot about uh, this sort of landscape and this uh, like, a, like the idea of, of tectonic plates. And I know I'm always like these, these, these uh, sort of descriptive drawings of these, uh, of these things to make people understand, oh, that's what's going on. I totally understand now. Yeah. You know, this is a great one. I love this sort of the shearing of this, uh, of one plate under the other. This is uh, what I was trying to convey uh, yeah, with uh, the, the Broward um, Gallery piece. This is the Broward County landfill site, right? This is what you see right off of the highway there on 95 there. It is the most just absurd looking thing. Uh, uh, Florida is extremely flat. And then there's this mountain sort of coming up out of nowhere, right in the middle of nowhere. Right, uh, it is the most unnatural looking thing. At least they're not sort of paving it or making making natural sort of unnatural landscapes out of it. They just kind of grasped it over and as if to say, we know it's here, but you know, just deal with it. Uh, I mean, the thing is, what else are you gonna do? Uh, I'm against landfill sites or anything, but I am reducing what we can consume uh, and what goes into landfill. So. That's uh, sort of my message, right? And this is the piece there in, uh, in Broward. So these, these uh, uh, bike rims uh, became my, my material of choice. Again, they're, they're very light. And, uh, and, uh, and the way we were building them, they're all tied together with some steel wire and they're hung in this space. So that, again, there's these two planes of, of earth that are colliding uh, into each other uh, to make this sort of uh, geological sort of cataclysm kind of thing. So. That's Antonio there. He's one of one of my helpers there. He was he was amazing. But uh, uh, as were so many others, uh, there was about three hundred and fifty rims that we had gotten from uh, various places, and it only took me a couple of months to accumulate all those rims. Right, uh, a very easy thing to do. They were all uh, headed for the uh, for for landfill. There's no recycling program for them. Uh, um, some of them make it to a scrap yard for the scrap metal, but most of them just go right into a, into landfill. It, it's, it's fun to think about all the, all, the, all the fun that was had on each one of these rims. Somebody went out for a, an awesome ride on every one of these rims. They were used and, uh, and um, they're, they're sort of spent, but uh, you know. There, there's Antonio again. He's uh, I got this off of Instagram. <laughs> it's funny because I left the, the gallery. I said goodbye to him. And like minutes later, that was on Instagram. I don't know. He must have been waiting to do that. But uh, I'm perfectly fine. That was a, a brilliant shot. So he's like riding the invisible bike. All right. So this is an organization that I'm uh, in, involved with here in Charleston, Second Chance Bikes. It's where the source of the, a lot of those rims came from. You know, I mean, this is something that uh, I think we, we should all be focusing on, right? If, if I can get really preachy uh, about, about our environment and things, I mean, if you give money to save the Amazon forest or something, uh, I mean, that's great. But it, you, left, you get left feeling a little bit empty, I think, right? Uh, but if you focus on your community, focus on your, uh, your own surroundings, your immediate surroundings to make the world better, I, I think it's, it's super rewarding, right? Uh, go there and I volunteer, I fix bikes, I, I help build bike racks or whatever they need. And it's, uh, it, it's a great uh, experience. And, and, uh, and, and, and as this little story says right here, this guy had no bike, he had no independence, no freedom. I mean, I, I, I didn't fix that bike, but I mean, in some way I'm helping that. And, I, and I, that feels so awesome. And I don't need to, to you know, 
uh, do uh, greater you know things. But that that's a shot of the, uh, the 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 shop there at Second Chance Bikes. Again, just just an ocean of bikes. There's probably a thousand bikes in there, right? I mean, uh, where do they people just just go through them so quickly? Uh, another thing that is without it, all this would just be in the landfill, and uh, and it's and it's sad. Are there any questions, anybody? Any questions, you guys can put it in the chat or if you wanna raise your hand on, on here, I can call on you. Any questions? Hi, I have a question. Ethan, go ahead. Um, hi, Jared, it's Sylvie. Oh, Sylvie, hi there, Sylvie, sorry, there was a... Yeah. Someone with a raised hand there. Sylvie, go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. I don't have the uh, view up of the uh, viewers. Um, I was wondering if you have any ideas uh, what you might like to either do next conceptually or what kinds of materials you might like to work with in the future. Well, that, that's a great question. You know, uh, it's, uh, I'm always keeping my eyes open, I think. Uh, I'm always uh, looking for things, but uh, the, the best things happen by an accident. The best things happen when, when this, this, this shipment of like, like whatever sort of comes to me for some reason. Some re someone recently gave me a, like a bunch of defective sunglasses, about 10,000 pairs of sunglasses, like still in the box. They have a little blur on the lens. Like it's absurd. Like, like I, I, like I want to use these. I don't know how. They're impenetrable. They're like they're, you, they can't be sort of glued to or anything. So I, I'm really trying to figure out how to use these these sunglasses. But it's is uh, it's whatever's going to come to me, right? Um, uh, I, I don't have. I, I try not to be uh, too like sort of focused on, on on finding that one thing. I have to find some. Yeah, I don't know what it is, right? But. Uh, I, I, I'm just too open to, to anything. So. Very cool. Thank you. No problem. And uh, Ethan, your question? Y yes, thank you very much. Um, at, at, like, I just want to say, like, like when, how you said earlier, like when you first sh showed us SCARP, you let, you know, it kind of reminds me, of, like, of something I did, like, two years ago. Like, you, you like, I... Uh, you, you, you like I uh, like I put I tied up some clothes with zip ties and like 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 all sorts like pants and you and shirts you and jeans and uh, and I placed them all all over a, an old dresser that you that once belonged to my grandmother and I called it inside out it's because it's is like the clothes are like outside the dresser dress when they should be inside and so mm -hmm. yeah you, you know, I'm glad you know, I just want to say I'm glad to know that I'm not the only one. No, I mean, the thing is, I, I, the, the part of what makes those clothing pieces successful is that people have a real relationship with clothing. People uh, identify immediately with that jacket or that pair of pants that they had. I had those, you know, and, and they know right away. So it's, a, it's this access point that I think everybody can get into. And, uh, and like I said, that's the reason why I think it, it, can, it can really do things, uh, those kinds of materials. So. Uh, any other questions? You can write it in the chat or if you want to raise your hand up or just even yell it out. I have a question. Go ahead. What was your hardest material to put together? <laughs> oh, wow. I, you know, uh, I'm not a fan of those golf clubs, even less, right, uh, than I was before. I, like I said, I've never really been into golf or anything, but uh, but moving uh, 3,000 golf clubs around is, is just a, a really hard thing to do. Uh, uh, you really have to move them one by one. You, you can't grab a handful like you think you could uh, because they're all sort of tangled. It's really, it's really awful stuff. Um, you know, um, I, like I... The, the tire tubes were really hard to, or the tires were the bicycle tires. 
uh, they're really kind of just hard on your hands working those things. Um, um, I, 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 and the thing is, it's like I can do anything uh, for the sake of my work. But when I when I show up at a school and I have to sort of motivate students to to do this really kind of a little bit nasty thing, uh, it's something else. You have to really be uh, sort of patient and understanding uh, for their for their sake. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, uh, most of the time it it gets done without a problem. So uh, um, I mean, they must think it's worth it. So I don't know. I like uh, as far as the worst thing though. Like I've done some pretty nasty materials. That wire, they're all kind of bad. The thing about those materials is that they're not designed to do what I'm doing with them. So they don't want to behave uh, in the way I want them to behave. So you, there's a little bit of force going on there with a lot of those things to get them to, to do what I want. But they're not like tires are, or wheels are not structural uh, on themselves, right? You can't do that. Uh, clothing is not an architectural material, right? Uh, I'm pretty sure of it. Um, so uh, getting things to sort of behave that way is always a challenge. Uh, and, uh, and whenever I can, I will, I will do that sort of a bit of a practice to, uh, to make sure everything's gonna work properly. You don't want any surprises to happen when you show up for an installation, like, like the wire's not strong enough or, or the wheels don't connect in any way, right? Uh, you have to answer those questions in advance. Uh, Barbara has her hand up, and we have a few uh, questions in the chat, but let's go with uh, Barbara first. Hi, Jared. Hi. Um, I was wondering, when you, because you make some of, a lot of your work so that it can be taken apart again, have you reused stuff again and again to create different um, sculptures, structures, installations? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I don't want to do anything just one time. Uh, and, I, and I don't want to make a career out of one thing either, right? So I like to, whatever installation I do, I like to do it, you know, three or four times just to be sure that I, I like, I've, I've got everything I wanted out of it, right? Have I exhausted all the uh, uh, sort of avenues as far as joinery or as far as the aesthetics? or the form of these, uh, and just to be sure I got everything I can. So some, some things, I, the golf clubs I've used twice already, I'll, I'll probably use them again. Um, I, uh, those, those pants for that project, those accumulated for a few different things. Uh, uh, well, yes, that's, absolutely. that's really great because it's really, you know, what you're living for, recycling and reusing and stuff. And so when you reuse your material again and again, I think that just goes in to prove your point. You know yeah. that you can. The thing Thank is, you. I'm really fortunate to be working at the College of Charleston because they they have facility there. They we have a forklift where I can I can lift large crates and stack them away uh, and 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 sort of be a hoarder. Now uh, my uh, the senior faculty there, Herb Parker, is like the king of the hoarders, and I'm not even approaching his level of hoarding. But uh, <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I I do hoard some, you know. So. Thank you. So that actually kind of uh, goes into Andrea's question in the chat. She wants to know, what do you do with the materials when the exhibition is over? So some you definitely reuse, but ones that you're not planning on reusing to create the sculpture again. Yeah, well, the, the rims for the uh, rim rift piece there uh, are already promised to another artist. They, uh, uh, this one artist friend of mine in town here uh, this this guy kind of makes this stuff in his yard, and he uh, and he borrowed me some. He he was very specific. I will bore you these, but I I want them back, and I want more of the ones you're you're bring back. And I'm okay with that. I will uh, I will I will set them up with uh, with some rims there. That's okay. Uh, but uh, uh, some things get recycled. Um, most everything gets recycled. Anything I can get recycled. I, I mean, the, the thing is, when you start taking on a project. Like with the e-waste and stuff, you start finding things out about about the processes and and things about uh, that that maybe you were better off not knowing. It's kind of hard to know some like the way they recycle e-waste. Uh, it, it's super toxic for the environment. To burn the uh, to heat the rubber sheet off of a copper cable is uh, is extremely toxic thing to do, right? It makes you want that stuff to be left in the ground, right? Uh, but whenever possible, it all gets uh, 
uh, gets uh, recycled and very little goes, uh, goes to landfills. Great, uh, Hannah's question is, is there a reason you always work on such a large scale? Well, I, I think that uh, I've thought a lot about that, right? I mean, it comes uh, to be uh, my upbringing in Winnipeg, actually. The first slide I showed you guys is my hometown, right? There's very, when I was there, there really wasn't much of an art market going on there. I, like uh, I hung out with a lot of artists and a lot of artist friends, but there was very few, it was very rare to hear that you heard someone sold a piece, you sold something, holy cow, that's a miracle, right? Uh, but this thing was really liberating. In that culture emerged installation and performance art and uh, experimental animations and things uh, and things that uh, people just kind of did what they wanted to do and didn't ever think about uh, trying to make a sale. So uh, installation and working with space uh, became my thing. I, like I, uh, I, like I rarely sell any any work. I, I do do some commission work from time to time, but uh, 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 filling rooms and things is uh, was al has always been creating those environments uh, was kind of my thing from the start. So. Uh, Beth has a question. Uh, can you share your uses of recycled materials, such as the dishes and silverware from restaurants in Charleston? Uh, well, sure. I, I mean, I did a piece uh, called um, uh, called Sunfire Remains, right? It was this project I did in, in this restaurant where I took all the all the um, plates and chairs and, and knives and forks and stuff from the old, this old restaurant. And then they renovated it into this new restaurant. And I put this mural with all that stuff sort of glued onto the wall uh, onto there. But I, I don't have an image of it here. I, I apologize, but uh, um, uh, you know, it, it had this sedimentary layers that you've seen in a lot of my work uh, going on there, these contoured lines. I, again, it was a, a thing where I didn't consume anything and, and, and I only, only used what was there. And the thing is, uh, they, they, I said, I want what was in the old restaurant. And I went there and, and I said, you can have as much as you want. And I'm like, I took pretty much everything. I still got a lot of that stuff because it, to me, it was like a gold mine. I mean, this is, this, I can have all these glasses and all these ashtrays. Like, are you crazy is my, is my attitude, but uh Maybe I'm the one that's crazy. I got like a thousand ashtrays now, so great. <laughs> uh, Sylvie has a question in the chat. Do you think other artists can be convinced to use upcycled materials? And if so, how? Well, I, I, like I think about that, uh, that artist, Tara Donovan, right? Uh, like I always think about the, like the value of things, the importance of, of, of these works of art. Tara Donovan is a very important artist. She's, she's doing great cultural significance, right, with her work and, and making this commentary about, uh, about uh, uh, consumer culture, even though she is consuming all those cups, right? It is incredibly valuable. Uh, uh, although me, per so the artist in me likes that, but, uh, uh, but the sort of Reuser in me, uh, I just can't stand the sight of those wasted cups, right? But again, they're not wasted, they're very valuable. So, like, I, um, I don't know, like, uh, I'll, I, like, I try to incorporate it into my class. We do a found object pro project, and, uh, and, uh, and using things around you is, uh, is, is, uh, is a lot more fun, I think. But, uh, but you know, there's, uh, there, there's no way to, uh, to sort of, um, I don't know, force people, they have to be interested in it. They have to, uh, they have to really uh, uh, take on that mission on their own, I think. And seeing pieces like this may, may encourage other artists possibly, so. I, I hope yeah. so. I mean, that is, that is the dream of any artist, you know. I, I would like to like talking to young artists and, and seeing them, getting them motivated. Uh, um, it's, it's, a, it's part of a bonus, part of the, the, the high, I guess, I don't know. Uh, Hannah says, "Do you feel your access to waste? Uh, do you feel your access to waste because of consumer culture is unique to the U.S.?" Uh, no, I don't think so. It is a it's, it's very much a capitalist kind of uh, thing. I, I've done some uh, uh, the books I sent you. I go into the idea about capitalism and the and the sort of toxicity and associated with that. I think uh, it is a. Uh, 
Uh, I mean, there's too much um, sort of wealth driven um, approach to business, approach to manufacturing, uh, approach to everything um, and, and very little responsibility taken, I think. Uh, you know, and um, and maybe we need the government to force us to do that. I don't know, but uh, uh, we could all just sort of take up, uh, roll up our sleeves a little bit and do it ourselves before we're forced to, I think, so. But um, I don't know, it's hard, hard to say. Thank you. Uh, unless there's uh, any other questions. Oh, wait, there's two, another, uh, Nestor. Nestor has his hand up, go ahead. Um, so my question is, what was your most impressionable art? Will there be from the community or because the uh, the materials were fun to work with or whatever you found that was impressionable? Like about this, just this project or in general? In general. Well, I mean, uh, I would say that the, the, the experience of working in the spaces, I, I've worked with students and I've worked with volunteers uh, from the community and, and they're, and they're, it's uh, what I, uh, one thing I, that I like to do is I like to sit back and just listen to just this sort of chatter that goes on as people are, are, are going through the clothing in particular and they're holding up these shirts and, and, and connecting and, Everyone's got a story about that that shirt or that pair of pants or that or that bicycle tire or whatever it is, uh, and it's and it's really a part of the community uh, that that is around the work. It's it's really a, a big part of, of what I enjoy about it. So uh, I think that would be my favorite part. I, like I haven't ever recorded anything like that, but uh, I mean. Uh, I I don't know. I, I enjoy telling stories. I think, and I, I enjoy. Uh, with other people telling them as well. So, but I, I've never considered uh, recording them and then sort of using that as a medium in some way. But that the listening part is, is the best. Uh, in or, this chat, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, cool. Like that. Thank you. Uh, in uh, the chat, Rob says, you made a great, maybe the best point of new artists feeling as though they are copying a previous work of art. Do you feel that challenge for new artists will become greater in the sense with the rise of social media and maybe some advice for new artists going through this? I mean, embrace it. Don't, don't shy away from it. If you hear something similar or you, or you see something similar, embrace that, right? I mean, that guy, Derek, that guy did the clothing thing, he reached out, he said, hey man, that, that looks like my stuff, right? Look what I'm doing, look what I'm doing. Now he's like, like uh, there's such a connection there. Uh, in, 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 I, he's like an ally of mine and, we, and, uh, and I'm confident that, uh, like I say, one day we'll, we'll, we'll show together, I'm sure of it. Embrace that, don't shy away. If you see someone that's doing something similar, say, hey, Let's, uh, let, let's show online together or let's show together. Or if you're a musician, let's, let, let's, let's make a song together. You know, we, we think alike. It only makes sense that we collaborate. I mean, uh, it, it's, it's going to happen more and more. Uh, the world's getting smaller. Okay. Uh, so uh, things are going to uh, overlap unintentionally or intentionally. Doesn't matter. Embrace it. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Jared? Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us tonight, for sharing your inspirations, your insights. Um, Sharon asks, after COVID, will you come to Canada? <laughs> Only if that's my sister. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you so, so much. Um, if uh, for anyone that hasn't uh, viewed the exhibition yet, uh, especially for those of you at a distance, um, you can view it at BrowardVPA.com. Uh, those of you that are local, especially uh, students and faculty, uh, we welcome you to come visit the work in the gallery. It runs through January 13th. And there really is nothing like seeing it in person if you are able. Uh, of course, masks and social distancing. Um, so thank you so much, Jared. It was really a pleasure to meet you and work with you and, um, and watch and participate in this uh, beautiful sculpture being born. So thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I was, I was delighted to be here. It's a great, it's a, all a good experience. Thank you.